God is good. Good morning, Seeker Hill. So good to see each and every one of y'all. Today, we're going to be talking about covenants. Somebody say covenants. That's what we're going to be talking about today. First of all, what is a covenant? A covenant is a simple way to describe it, to understand it is two different people are making an agreement, uh, a contract, so to speak, usually for protection or food, that sort of thing. You promise to do this for me, and I promise I'll do this for you, right? That sort of thing. In ancient times, the way they would conduct a covenant ceremony, because they would do a whole ceremony, the way they would conduct a ceremony is they would cut an animal in half, place one half of the animal on one side, place the other half of the animal on the other side. I mean, it was a very bloody thing. And then what both parties would do is they would walk between the halves. They would walk between the pieces. You And, and I'm not just making this up. Of course, you can see a great picture of this in Jeremiah 32. That's where I, I have this understanding. In Jeremiah 32, you have the royal family of Israel, you have the leading religious families of Israel, and then you have the common people. In Jeremiah 32, they all participate in this very bloody, very gory covenant ceremony where they cut these animals in half and then they walk between the pieces. And it's not even just in Jeremiah, it's all the way back in Genesis, uh, God did this with Abraham. Abraham got some animals that God himself told him to get and he cut the animals in half. And, and what's supposed to happen after you cut the animals in half is the two parties who are coming together, right? These two parties, they've already made these agreements. The terms of the covenant have already been stated or written. And both parties, have ba they basically agree and on the terms of the covenant that have been written or stated. And then they walk between the pieces, between the pieces of this animal that has been slaughtered, cut in half. And the reason they do that is because it's as if to say... May what happened to these animals happen to the one who breaks this covenant. Dang. Can you imagine getting a mortgage, getting a loan for a house, and the bank is like, yeah, we're going to cut these animals in half, walk between the pieces, and say, if you don't keep your end of the deal on this mortgage, <laughs> may what happened to these animals happen to you <laughs> if you break your end of the deal. Can you imagine applying uh, or getting... <laughs> Getting something at Walmart and that was the deal, right? They cut an animal in half. May what happen to these animals happen to you? That would be wild. You, all of a sudden, it would, get real, it would get a lot more serious, right? Oh, shoot. I better not break this covenant. <laughs> and that's what I want to talk with you about today. I want to talk with you about that, that aspect of the covenant. I've talked about covenant so many times. It's crazy. I, I, I've talked about... Uh, the benefits of the covenants, the promises of the covenants. I've covered different covenants in the Bible. I've talked about the dangers of forgetting about these covenant benefits that belong to you as a Christian, as a son or daughter of Abraham. And, and yet I've never talked about one of the most important aspects of the covenant, and that is the possibility of one party breaking the terms of the covenant. Wow. You and I are in covenant with God, church. And, and, and I want to talk today about the idea that covenant breaking was a real thing. Covenant breaking in the Bible was a real risk. And really anytime, whether in the Bible or outside of the Bible, covenant breaking was a real risk being taken every time you made a covenant agreement with someone. I want you to say that out loud real quick so you can kind of feel it with me. Covenant breaking. Just like today, when finance companies give someone a loan, right, the risk is that this person will violate the terms of the agreement and not pay what they said they would pay. That's, that's a risk, right? We're, we're, that's why they say, that's why sometimes people might apply for a loan, they don't get it because like the, your credit history, like, bro, this is too risky, <laughs> right? Well, it was the same thing in the Old Testament. When God would make these covenant agreements with his people, he also knew that he was taking a risk. And I think we kind of forget that about God, that he thought about this. It wasn't just like random, like he knew, man, I'm getting into a covenant with these humans, with my creation. And what if they break the covenant? That was a real risk God knew he was taking. And I want to remind you, that God has invested so much in you because he believes in you. He knows what you're capable of. 
Remember, he told Peter, yeah, come out, walk on the water. You know, I know what you can do. He would rebuke his disciples time and again. Oh, you have little faith. Haven't you learned anything? Like, I've been investing in you. Covenant is an investment. I'm going to take a real risk here investing in you. The, remember, I always freak people out with this one, but the word invest, the etymology of it means to get naked. That's what the word invest means. It come, it come, that word vest comes from the word vestments. To, to invest is to give away your vestments. It's to be vulnerable, to take a risk. So to really invest, that's why marriage, marriage is the, the, one of the greatest or most riskiest investments you can make because you give away all your vestments. <laughs> they all come off. <laughs> This is why marriage was one of the first institutions to be created by God. Because we're supposed to follow his example, right, of love. That's real love. Love, investing in someone. Of risking everything for the person you love. Whew. That's crazy. By the way, I was thinking the other day, people say, I, I just, I don't love this person anymore. Like, well, technically that's impossible because love is a choice. Something you do. Now, it is possible in that you can say, I don't love this person anymore. Oh, it, that, you're talking about eros love. That's a different kind of love. That's Red Bull love. That's, that's that excitement love that fizzles, fizzles away. Fizzles away. But agape love, where the Bible says God is love, that, that's, something, that's a choice you make. You, you can't just all of a sudden not do that anymore. Anyway, <laughs> but it's risky. The marriage covenant, that's a covenant we're all familiar with. It is risky because you're risking everything for this person you love. And you can kind of see why God takes marriage covenants so serious. People today don't get married, probably or partly because the whole covenant aspect of it scares them, right? The covenant commitment that God wants them to make in front of him and, his, and people, they don't want to make that because it's like, well, what if it doesn't work out? What, what if she breaks my heart? <laughs> oh, you're breaking my heart. She might break your heart. Duh, oh, she is going to break your heart. Of course she is. And of course you're going to break her heart because you're an idiot. We're all going to break each other's hearts. It's going to happen. Duh. <laughs> you're going to roll over in bed one day and hate this person you're, you're laying next to. It's going to happen. Duh. Get over it. <laughs> do what God told you to do. He wants you to marry her. He wants you to marry him. Exactly. Some people, are, they end up together so long, the law is like, you guys are married. That's it. Get out of my face. <laughs> you're forced into it. Yes, God, I'll tell you this, God takes marriage covenant so serious that he promised wives that if husbands break their marriage covenant, God would close one of his ears, basically. Not completely, partially, that's why just one ear. First Peter 3, 7 says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Dang, that's a harsh word for husbands. I'm sorry, husbands, if you're on this call, about to be husbands. Man, God's saying, if you don't honor your wife, bro, I'm going to close one of my ears on you. That nothing will hinder your prayers. God takes the marriage covenant that serious. And, 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 I, and I would imagine, right, 1 Peter 3, 7, 2,000 years ago, if women were were probably the ones that would have been disrespected more than the men, obviously. But so, but God takes that marriage covenant so serious that he would even he would even tell one of his own sons, like, yo, I'm going to close one of my ears on you, so don't, don't play around with this thing. Now, if you want me to open both my ears, I don't know about you guys, but I, I don't want God to close one of his ears on me. I need both open. Amen? I need them both open. I can't risk it. You need to honor my wife. I need both ears open. What do I got to do to get us straight? Because, man, I, I need God to hear my prayers. Both ears. Amen? I mean, you take 1 Peter 3, 7. Tell me how to interpret it then if you don't believe. That's, that pretty much sounds to me like what it says. Because what would a man be praying anyway, right? But the Lord's prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, that kind of prayer is going to be the bulk of a man's prayer life, right? So you would imagine a man praying, God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's like, uh-uh. Ain't no this whole bringing heaven to earth thing. Not if you ain't honoring your wife. How am I bring heaven to earth and your wife's over there all sad and depressed because you trip? No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I love, that's a God you can trust, man. And I would imagine the same thing applies to the wife. You get what I'm saying. But anyway, the point is that God takes marriage covenants that serious. God takes covenants that serious. 
God takes covenant breaking that serious. I'll share this story. God takes covenant so serious that Joshua, for those of y'all don't know, there's a book in the Bible named Joshua. It's about a guy named Joshua. And Joshua gets tricked into making a covenant with some people. But the, the, he already made the covenant with these people. He got tricked into making this covenant. But it's already sealed. It's already a done deal. And God's like, dude, he knows. Like, I can't break the covenant. I made the covenant with these people. They tricked me. But I already made it. I can't just break it now. Shoot. And he actually keeps the covenant. He doesn't break it. He already made it. Because he knows God takes covenant serious. And I'm one of his people. I can't just make one of them break it. Like, dude. And, and let's read it together. In Joshua chapter 9. I'm going to be reading it out of the easy to read version. Um, Joshua and the Israelites, they, they're going into the promised land. They've already conquered a couple kingdoms. Like, man, crazy stuff. They're getting victory after victory. And they're about to take even more land, conquer even more kingdoms. And in verse 1, it says this. All the kings, Joshua 9, all the kings west of the Jordan River heard about these things. They were the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. They lived in the hill country and in the plains. They also lived along the sea coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far as Lebanon. All these kings came together and made plans to fight against Joshua and the Israelites. Verse 3 is awesome. But the people from the city of Gibeon heard about the way Joshua had defeated Jericho and Ai. So they decided to try to trick the Israelites. Oh, they didn't just try. They did it. But anyway, this was their plan. They gathered together old wineskins that were cracked and broken. They put these old wineskins on the backs of their animals. They put old pieces of cloth on their animals to look as if they had traveled from far away. The men put old sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. They found some old bread that was dry and moldy. They went to the camp of the Israelites. Then they went to the camp of the Israelites. This camp was near them, basically. The men went to Joshua and said to him, Joshua, oh, oh, they're, they're tired. They've been traveling a long time. We have traveled from a far away country. Notice they don't tell them where they're really from. We have traveled from a far away country. We want to make a peace agreement with you. Peace agreement. This is a covenant. Covenant language. Verse 7, the men of Israel said to these Hivite men, maybe you're trying to trick us, bro. <laughs> maybe you actually live near us. We cannot make a peace agreement with you till we know where you're from. Verse 8, the Hivite men said to Joshua, we're your servants. Notice how they don't say where they're from. We need to know where you're from. That we're your servants. But Joshua said, Joshua asked, but who are you? Where do you come from? Verse 9, the men answered, we're your servants. We have come from a faraway country. We came because we heard of the great power of the Lord your God. They tell them all the stuff they want to hear. We heard about what he had done and about everything he did in Egypt. And, and we heard that he defeated the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan River. Uh, this was King Sion of Heshbon, King Og of Bashan, the land of Asherah. So our elders and our people said to us, take enough food for your journey. Go and meet with the Israelites and tell them we're your servants. Make a peace agreement with us. And in verse 12, they say, look at our bread. <laughs> this is awesome. Look at our bread. When we left home, it was warm and fresh. These were fresh tortillas, man, when we left. Homemade by grandma. Homemade fresh tortillas, flour tortillas, man. It was warm and fresh, but now you can see it's dry and old. They're basically chips now. <laughs> now Look at our clothes and sandals. You can see that the long journey has almost destroyed the things we wear. Verse 14, they still haven't said where they're from. But the men of Israel wanted to know if these men were telling the truth. So they tasted the bread. They tasted the tortilla. Sure enough, it was as hard as chips. <laughs> but they did not ask the Lord what they should do. Oh, that, that's always a bad thing. If you're gonna, if you got a big decision you're about to make, you should really spend some time with God on it. That's true. There's no way around that. You should pray about it. Unless what you need to do is already in the written word, right? You're supposed to just do it, right? You don't have to pray like, should I give today? Like, that's already in the word. God's not even going to answer you. <laughs> um, anyway, Joshua agreed to make peace with them. Oh, even though he didn't even ask God if he should. Joshua agreed to make peace with them. He agreed to let them live. And the leaders of Israel agreed with this promise. Now watch this. Three days later, the Israelites learned that these men lived very near their camp. 
Remember, they said, we come from far away. Three days later, after they make a covenant agreement with them, they find out that these guys actually live down the street. Hilarious. Verse 17, so the Israelites went to the place where they lived. That's hilarious. On the third day, the Israelites came to the cities of, the, of Gibeon. Gibeon. Imagine somebody owes you money, and you were, you were going to go pick it up, but they told you, oh, I'm not home right now. I'm out of the country. Can I pay you next month? And so you say, yeah, sure. Uh, and they say, is the 31st okay, the end of the month? Yeah, sure. And then later that day, you see them outside putting the trash out. Even though they just told you they were out of the country, so you go knocking on the door like, what the heck? This guy told me he was out of the country. He's I agreed that he could pay me next month because I thought, oh my goodness. And can you imagine knocking on the door? Israel is there. They walked over there where these guys are from. You guys told us you live far away. Can you imagine knocking on the door? And, and your son is looking through the people like, oh crap, it's Joshua and the Israelites. They're here. Basically, the Gibeonites don't care. They're like, open the door. We already made a peace agreement with them. We already made a covenant with them. That is hilarious. Verse 18, but the army of Israel did not try to fight against those cities because they had made a peace agreement with them. They had made a promise to them before the Lord, the God of Israel. I'll skip down to verse 22. Joshua called the Gibeonites together. He said, why'd you lie to us? Your land was near our camp, but you told us you were from a far away country. Let's skip down to verse 24. The Gibeonites answered, we lied to you because we were afraid of you. We were afraid you would kill us. We heard that God commanded his servant Moses to give you all this land. And God told you to kill all the people who live in this land. That is why we lied to you. Now we're your servants. You can do whatever you think is right. Wow. Joshua basically says, we got tricked, but we can't break the covenant. We can't break the covenant. And he doesn't. Instead of praying to God, we, go, we went ahead and decided to taste their tortillas. Sure enough, they were as hard as chips. We got tricked. The tortilla tricked us. <laughs> Crap. But they don't break the covenant because they know they serve a God who keeps covenant. And you're not supposed to break covenant once you make a covenant. I'll say that last line again. You're not supposed to break a covenant once you make a covenant. And God... According to the scriptures, church, me and you are in covenant with God. And the sign of our covenant is baptism. That's the sign of our covenant. That we're baptized into the family of God. God has circumcised our hearts. Baptism and confession. We've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. Those are the signs that we're in covenant with God. Me and you are in covenant with God. And I want to... I want you to know, church, when God got in covenant with us, from the very first covenant he ever made, he already knew that we wouldn't keep up our end of the deal. He knew we would break this covenant. He knew we wouldn't keep up with it. From the very first covenant, you look at the Adamic covenant. I went over this Wednesday night. You look at the Adamic covenant. When Adam and Eve sinned, God killed an animal, probably sheepskin, and then he covered them with it. So God took the life of a lamb in order to cover Adam and Eve, foreshadowing his own son, who would one day be the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He are, he's already seen, God himself is already seeing the sacrifice his own son is going to make, him and his son, because of our proclivity to break covenant. In the Noahic covenant, the covenant that God made with Noah in the world, he said, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky, that word bow, he doesn't say rainbow, it just says a bow. The word bow there is the same word you use for bow and arrow. Only this bow is facing God, not us. Every time you see a rainbow in the sky, it's a it's it's a it's a it's a weapon, basically, and it's facing God, not us. Because in committing to humanity, God's saying, I know that an arrow is going to pierce my heart. I know an arrow is coming. And it's going to pierce my heart, not yours. In the Abrahamic covenant, remember, God walked through the pieces. Because what was he saying? Abraham, I know you're going to break this covenant. 
but I'm going to suffer the consequences. In the Mosaic Covenant, if you look in Deuteronomy 28, it tells you about all these blessings that belong to you if you keep the covenant. But what happened? It also talks about all the curses that will happen if you break it. But remember on the cross, the Bible says that Jesus became a curse for us so that we could have the blessing. Matter of fact, in the Mosaic Covenant, the biggest consequence that you can experience for breaking the covenant is called exile, being banished from the land. Being banished from the land is to be driven from the presence of God. And so on the cross, Jesus becomes a covenant breaker. Even though he never broke covenant, he becomes one on the cross. And that's why he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the biggest consequence in the Mosaic Covenant for breaking covenant. So Jesus experienced the curse of breaking the covenant, even though he didn't, so we could experience the blessing that you get for keeping the covenant, even though we didn't. God knew, church, that we wouldn't keep up the covenant. But I want to remind you, church, that we are new covenant believers. And here's what's so awesome about the new covenant. I'll end with this. The only way, technically the only way you can break the new covenant is if you stop trusting Jesus. You would think that the only way, you would think that one of the ways you break covenant with God is if you sin. But no, actually in the new covenant, the only way you break covenant is if you sin and don't trust Jesus with it. See, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The only way you can break the new covenant is not if you sin, but if you don't trust Jesus with your sin once you do. Because that is what the new covenant is all about. Trusting not in your righteousness, but in his righteousness. The greatest thing you can do to offend God is to not trust his son. I'll say that again. The greatest offense you can commit in front of God is to not trust his son. So I want to remind everybody today, if you're here and maybe you've sinned, maybe you've done things intentionally, you know God didn't tell you to do that. You know God didn't tell you to say that. I want to remind you, you haven't broke the covenant yet unless you're not going to trust Jesus with that mistake. Are you going to try to make up for your own mistakes? Are you going to try to spend your whole life trying to make up for that mistake? Are you going to say, no, 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 I can't talk to God because I know he's so mad at me. So you're trusting in your righteousness. And you're saying the only way you can get right with God is if you do all these, all these holy things. Or are you going to say, no, I could trust Jesus and be made holy right now. Because if that's the case, then you're still in covenant. And you haven't broken anything. So I, when you sin, don't break the covenant. Don't break the covenant, church. Keep it going. Don't break the covenant. When you sin, ask God to forgive you, as 1 John 1, 9 says. Confess it to God and to another human being. And trust Jesus, not your own righteousness. That's how you keep covenant with God. So I want to pray for you right now. For anybody on this call that needs to either get in covenant with Jesus for the first time, how do you do that? You let him forgive you for all your sins. And then for those believers in Christ, I want to pray for you too, because maybe you've sinned and you think that made you get out of covenant, but no, the only way to get out of this is if you don't trust Jesus with your mistake. I want you to realign yourself by saying, yeah, I've been doing some crap I shouldn't be doing. I need to confess it, be honest about it, and do what God called me to do. And the first step is to trust Jesus with my mistake. I want you to pray this prayer with me so you can get in covenant with God. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash them away with your blood. I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior and my Lord. And I'm making a vow right now to serve you, Jesus, as Lord of my life for the rest of my life. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. And now I want to pray for those of you who are you're already in Christ. 
And today, the enemy is losing his grip on you because now you're realizing it's never been about you. It's about Jesus. Put it back on him. His grace is greater than your sin. Your sin can't stop God's grace, but God's grace can stop your sin dead in its tracks. So Heavenly Father, I thank you that no matter how many mistakes we've made, no matter how many times we've fallen down, we can get up by your grace. So God, shower your grace on those today who need it the most. Those who feel like they've made the greatest mistakes, may they receive your grace today by faith. May they say, there's, there's, I can't do anything in my own strength. I need to trust you, Jesus. Give them the will to do your will, God. Give them the strength to do your will. Holy Spirit, continue to point them to Jesus. And I thank you that he is sufficient for their holiness, for their righteousness, for their justification, for their wisdom, for everything they could ever need. And may they begin to feel validated right now for the Spirit of God saying, it's all about Jesus. He is everything you need. And so I thank you right now. The peace of God will begin to take over their hearts and minds as they trust that Jesus is more than enough. I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hallelujah.